Hello, I'm Mary Morrissey and I will be talking about some of the ways that we can tackle the historical context of Shakespeare's King Lear. The first thing I want to say, however, is that I will not be talking about a historical background. If we think of context as background, we risk talking about it in ways that suggests it's static. History is about the tension between continuity and change. If we imagine that there is a single historical background, we lose sight of the many different historical processes at work in any one period. Shakespeare lived through a time of huge political and cultural change and there is no one single context for the plays that he wrote. If we think about a historical background, we suggest that literary texts are somehow separate or static to their historical moment. The texts we study don't just reflect an element of the writer's culture, they may also affect changes to that culture. Louis Montrose, a new historicist critic, says that we need to attend to the historicity of texts and the textuality of history, the relationship between the text and its historical moment, not one as a mere reflection of the other. So what kind of context can we think of for King Lear? As with every play, there are many dates that we need to consider when we think about how the play relates to its historical moment. There's the date when the play is set, when the play was written, when the play was first performed in public and when the play was first made available through print. We should also consider when the play was revised in print or in production. In some ways, plays are constantly revised by directors in different productions. I'll run through some of these elements, but I am going to concentrate on the first, the date when the play is set. We don't know exactly when King Lear was written, but it was probably sometime between 1604 and 1606. The first printed edition says that the play was staged at court in, on St Stephen's Night in 1606. It was almost certainly performed in one of the public theatres in the city as well, either the Globe or the Indoor Theatre at Blackfriars. The first printed edition was a small quarto volume, it's around the size of a modern paperback, and that was printed around December 1607 or January 1608, which is quite soon after the production. The play also appeared in the first folio of Shakespeare's works that was printed in 1623, after his death. Let's contextualise this information then. What else was Shakespeare writing at this time? By the time he wrote Lear, Shakespeare had already written Hamlet and Othello. Some older critics argued that Shakespeare's tragedies get progressively darker, with Lear being the darkest. But Lear is not Shakespeare's last tragedy, and many of the plays written after Lear, such as The Winter's Tale, for example, are quite optimistic in tone. So Lear is not dark simply because Shakespeare was getting old and grumpy. We can also see from this list that Shakespeare was already very practised in the art of writing history plays. His two great tetralogies, two groups of, of four plays on English history, had already been written. Those are the plays of Henry VI, Part I, II and Three, Richard III, and then Richard II, Henry IV, Part I and II, and Henry V. But we can see that Shakespeare wasn't finished using historical sources. He would go back to the English chronicles for Macbeth, Cymbeline and Henry VIII and to Roman histories for Antony and Cleopatra, Julius Caesar and Coriolanus. King Lear is not an end point in Shakespeare's career, either, either as a writer of tragedy or as a writer of history. We can see that combination of two genres, um, history and tragedy, in the print history of this play as well. The first published version, the quarto version, describes the play as the history of King Lear, the true chronicle history of the life and death of King Lear. The folio version, published in 1623, describes the play very definitely as a tragedy, and I think it can be interpreted as both. I'm going to look at the setting of the play as it relates to these two genres, looking at it a King Lear as a history play and as a tragedy. To do that, we need to find Shakespeare's source, where he got the information about Lear. The source for the main plot about Lear and his daughters came from Shakespeare's reading of Raphael Holinshed's Chronicles of Great Britain and Ireland, the first edition published in 1577 and an expanded edition of 1587. This was a huge undertaking and, and a milestone in English history and publishing. 
The story of the subplot came somewhere else. It came from Sir Philip Sidney's very popular romance, um, The Countess of Pembroke's Arcadia. It's a digression on the story of the King of Paphlagonia that Shakespeare rewrote as the story of Gloucester. So let's look at the chronicle sources and Holinshed. Holinshed says that Lear lived in the year of the world 3105, that's 3000 years since creation, at what time Joas reigned in Judah. Comparing chronologies would leave us with a date for the play setting around 800 BC, but that's not terribly helpful as we don't know what Shakespeare's contemporaries would have made of that date, it being a rather modern way of thinking about time. The point is that Lear is a king in English history from a period before the Romans invaded and Elizabethan historians really have no information about that time. They had the medieval legend of Britain and um, the legend that descendants of the Trojans settled in Britain, Brutus um, being the, the founder of a kingdom there. And this was the framework that they usually used for thinking about the period before the Romans. Holinshed does tell this story. Before the story of Lear, we have the story of Brutus travelling from Troy to found the kingdom of Britain and how that kingdom was then divided by his descendants. It would be reunited by the Roman province in the Roman province Britannia, but only properly come together in 1603 when James VI of Scotland became James I of England and Ireland. The legend of Britain was being questioned in Shakespeare's day, but there is no real alternative narrative at this time, so they just have no real sense of what to make of the period before the Romans arrived. The Fool, in Act 3, says, This prophecy Merlin shall make, for I live before his time. And this, I think, is meant to suggest to the audience how far back in time King Lear is set. Shakespeare's audience would have known that the pre-Roman people in England at the time were pagan, but they wouldn't have known what kind of pagans they were. Shakespeare makes reference to classical pagan gods like Apollo and goddesses like Hecate to remind his audience that the characters are not Christian. The fact that the play is set in a pagan past is sometimes linked to its bleakness. Shakespeare's audience knew that classical pagan gods were often described as cruel and capricious. As flies to wanton boys are we to the gods, they kill us for their sport, Gloucester tells us in Act 4, and perhaps he assumed that these other pagan gods would have been similar. Productions have often stressed this setting in a very distant and unfamiliar past through their use of scenery. Here's a still from Peter Brook's very famous 1971 production. This had very minimal staging, but you can see that Lear's throne room includes this rather large megalith, this huge stone, which I think is meant to indicate a, a, a time very far back in the past. The sense of being not quite connected in time or in a very distant time um, it is also maintained through the subplot. The source for that came from Sir Philip Sidney's Arcadia. This was a long prose romance and romances uh, were a very popular genre in Shakespeare's time. They were adventure stories usually set long ago and often set far away. It's a bit like fantasy fiction um, in the modern world. The stories of King Arthur, for example, were very popular sources for romance. So the subplot of Lear also gives us a sense of being far away in time, being in a time of, of legend and perhaps of mystery. But this is a source and um, the source in the Chronicles is a source that Shakespeare had also used for his history plays. And we should also then for think about the Chronicles as a source for a history play. The choice of that story from the Chronicles and the choice of a story about a king and a civil war makes King Lear like the history plays in that it is a play about politics and about political theory. The plot of King Lear pivots on the action in the first scene. We are introduced to Gloucester and told of his two sons, thus introducing the subplot, and then we move immediately to the main plot and the division of the kingdom. Lear tells his court that he has decided to retire as king, he gives his daughters their inheritance and hands over control of the kingdom to them and their husbands. Cordelia is excluded and so the kingdom is divided between Regan and Goneril. Lear says that he will keep the name of king and 100 knights in his train. 
To understand how wrong this is, we need to think about Renaissance ideologies of kingship. Kings just don't retire. They are appointed by God to rule their kingdom and they have that responsibility until their death. It's not something they choose and it's not something they can give up. The ceremonies and respect that goes with kinship are necessary because the king has to have the authority to keep order. He is responsible to God for the governing of his kingdom and the ceremonies and rituals that go with that are designed to help him um, carry out the duty he's been given. Divided inheritance was allowed for ordinary people if they didn't have sons. Uh, Their goods would be divided equally between their daughters. But it was not allowed for monarchs. If a monarch only had daughters, the eldest daughter got the throne. That's how Queen Elizabeth became queen in 1558 and she was queen for much of the time that Shakespeare was alive, so he knew this fact well. Lear is treating his kingdom as if it was private property, as if it was a possession and not a duty and responsibility given to him. And I think his uh, the audience of this play would have been very aware of that mistreatment of his duty as king. Dividing the kingdom meant instability and war. And this was a theme that Shakespeare had dealt with thoroughly in the chronicle plays on the War of the Roses. Dividing the kingdom is a very politically hot topic in 1604 and 1606. King James VI and I of Scotland had attempted to create a political union between Scotland and England and Wales. And this unfortunately didn't work. However, because he was King of England, King of Ireland and King of Scotland, the crowns of the three kings were united since his accession to the English throne in 1603. The fate of England and Wales, of Scotland and Ireland now all depended on the character of one king. James was aware of the importance of union between the kingdoms and wrote in his advice book to the uh, son he thought would uh, reign after him, how important the keeping the kingdoms together would be. So in Basilican Doran, advice to the prince, he writes, and in case it please God to provide you to all these three kingdoms, make your eldest son Isaac, leaving him all your kingdoms and provide the rest with private possessions. Otherwise, by dividing your kingdoms, you shall leave the seed of division and discord among your posterity as befell to this isle by the division and assignment thereof to the three sons of Brutus, Locrine, Albanact and Camber. So uh, James the sixth and first advised his son to make one of his his eldest son his heir to the kingdom and provide private possessions to the others. They would not become kings. Only the eldest would be king. I'm not going to deal with the division of the kingdoms anymore because Dr. Lynn Robson has already dealt with it. There is much to be said, but I think she has already said much. And I want to look rather at how King Lear works as a tragedy and how the setting contributes to that. Lear is a play that circles around two notions that combined contribute much to the bleakness of the tone that modern critics have found in the play. The first is the idea that our human nature is drawn to and selfishness and cruelty as much as it is capable of sympathy and selflessness. There is also an idea that no divine force watches over human affairs to ensure that the wicked are punished and the good are rewarded. Both of these themes suited the time setting for the play, a past so ancient that Shakespeare and his contemporaries knew nothing of the religion or culture of the people except that they were pagan and perhaps believed in cruel and capricious gods. I want to suggest that King Lear might be thought of as a kind of thought experiment in which Shakespeare imagined the awful consequences of living without two of the most powerful ideas common in his period. He's imagining what a world would be like without the idea of natural law and without the idea of providence. And I want to look at these two concepts in turn. Natural law was the name that Renaissance philosophers gave to the theory that people could behave in moral and good ways even if they were pagan. Early modern Christians did not think that their religion gave them a monopoly on morality. Rather, they thought that God put the same principles about good and evil in every person. 
so pagans could still make good laws and live well. After all, some of the most revered people in history for Shakespeare and his contemporaries were pagan, those such as Aristotle and Socrates, pictured here by Raphael in the School of Athens. Richard Tucker, one of the most important philosophers of Shakespeare's day, said um, this. By the force of the light of reason wherewith God illumineth everyone which cometh into the world, men being enabled to know truth from falsehood and good from evil, do thereby learn in many things what the will of God is, which will himself not revealing by an extraordinary means unto them, but they by natural discourse attaining the knowledge thereof seem the makers of those laws which indeed are his, and they but only the finders of them out. So even pagans can produce laws that are in line with with the law of God because God has implanted in them a principle of natural justice and natural law. But in King Lear the characters question whether or not this is so. Sometimes characters comment that the behaviour of others is so awful it seems to cast doubt on the idea of natural law that we have all in within us a principle of morality. Um, Regan asks Gloucester why she has sent the king to Dover. This is before Gloucester has his eyes taken out. And this is his reply. Because I would not see thy cruel nails pluck out his poor old eyes, nor thy fierce sister in his anointed flesh stick boorish fangs. The sea, with such a storm as his bare head in hell black night endured, would have buoyed up and quenched the stalid fires. Yet, poor old heart, he hoped the heavens to rain. If wolves had at thy gate howled that stern time, thou shouldst have said, Good porter, turn the key, all cruel else subscribed but I shall see the winged vengeance overtake such children. The metaphor of wild animals here are important because animals were thought to be without reason and so without any sense of natural law or natural justice. Gloucester is saying that Regan and Goneril have behaved in ways that's worse than wild animals, that wild animals would have shown more native moral instinct than they have done. They have denied the very foundational principles of civilization, which is to give hospitality to those who need it. If wolves had held in the gate, she would have let them in. Good porter, turn the key. But rather instead, in this cruel storm, she allowed her father um, suffer uh, the wind and the rain on his bare head in hell black night. Gloucester expects that this cannot go unpunished. He thinks he will see winged vengeance overtake such children. And this brings us to our second idea, providence. Providence is the idea that God has a plan for human history and that he allows events to unfold in a way that facilitate this ultimate plan. Although human beings have free will, God will sometimes intervene directly to ensure that good overcomes evil. This was a very popular idea in Shakespeare's time and it is often found in political pamphlets to explain that God is on the side of England. In this pamphlet here, we see that God sends a wind in 1588 to scatter the Spanish Armada. And again in 1605, the date is here, we see Guy Fawkes sneak into the Parliament House to blow it up in the gunpowder plot, but the eye of God is on him and says, Video, Rideo, I see and mock, God will not allow the plot to succeed. But again, whether or not God or the gods will intervene to see justice done is doubted by many of the characters in King Lear. In Act 4, Scene 2, open, he says, Wisdom and goodness to the vile seem vile, filth savours but themselves. What have you done? Tigers, not daughters, what have you performed? A father and a gracious aged man, whose reverence even the head-lugged bear would lick, most barbarous, most degenerate, have you madded? Could my good brother suffer you to do it, a man, a prince, by him so benefited? If that the heavens do not their visible spirits send quickly down to take these vile offences, it will come. Humanity must perforce prey on itself like monsters in the deep. Albany quotes the same images of um, wildness and cruelty that we've seen in Gloucester. These are wrongs so bad they make us doubt the natural order, make us doubt the presence of natural law in um, the sisters. But he also expects that the heavens must respond to such monstrous behaviour and send quickly down visible spirits to punish the sisters. Otherwise, he said, 
Humanity must perforce prey on itself. All sense of moral order in humanity will be lost. It just is important to the fitness of things, um, to, to a sense of a providential order that these things cannot go unpunished. Modern readings of the play have adjusted more easily to this idea that there is neither natural law nor a providential order making things come out right. We see this in readings particularly of the storm or the heath scene. The main and the subplot come together here. Lear finds shelter in a hovel that Edgar, disguised as poor Tom, is already sheltering in and the two talk. Lear recognises human poverty and misery in poor Tom. Take physic pump expose thyself to feel what wretches feel, he says. And he discovers that unaccommodated man, man without the trappings of kinship and power, is no more than such a poor, bare-forked animal as poor Tom. Modern critics have read into these scenes a statement about the human condition that stripped of social status and wealth and prestige, we are no more than such a poor, bare-forked animal. And Lear has been linked to 20th century ideas of existential angst, if you like, anxiety um, from realising the meaninglessness of human actions and achievements in a world without natural law and without providence. Jan Cott, in his Shakespeare Art Contemporary of 1965, famously compared King Lear to Samuel Beckett's Endgame for this reason. If we think of this as a play that deliberately excludes the usual mechanism for making things come out right, natural law and providence, then I think we can understand why the ending is so very bleak, and it is deliberately bleak. In Hollinshed's Chronicles, Lear and Cordelia win the battle and Lear lives rules after this by the space of two years and then died 40 years after he first began to reign. There's also a difference between the quarto and the folio versions of the end of the play. The quarto attributes the last lines to Albany and the folio gives these lines to Edgar. I wonder if Shakespeare was unhappy about the ending and was still revising it. More interestingly, from 1681 until 1838, Shakespeare's version of the play wasn't staged. A revision written by a 17th century dramatist, Nahum Tate, was used instead. Nahum Tate's version of King Lear has a relatively happy ending. Lear and Cordelia win the battle against Goneril and Regan and Cordelia lives and marries Edgar. The ending of King Lear offers little hope of a restoration of political or moral order than Shakespeare's source would have allowed and theatre audience seem to have preferred Nahum Tate's version for a very long time. I wonder if Shakespeare's ending of the story that has this thought experiment where natural law and providence are missing was just too alien for modern audiences and I'm going to leave it there. Thank you very much. <laughs>